Welcome to To Know the Love of Christ. Welcome back. We're so glad that you're joining us this week. Just to recap, last week we were in Ecclesiastes 4, and we discussed the different format, I guess you would say, that the author has, whereas before he had a lot of, um, everything was chunked together and the topics flowed a different way, and now we get into this somewhat Proverbs, proverbial, I don't know if proverbial is the right word, (laughs) but this Proverbs format with smaller chunks of scripture that are topical. And we walked through those and we discussed how when we're working, there is a purpose behind our work and there are different ways that we can approach that incorrectly, but there is a happy medium and a balance. And we discussed that as the author has been stating, you know, basically life is hevel when it's without God. He often brings up everything is hevel But with God, our life can have meaning and purpose. And so we discussed that briefly. So if you will turn to Ecclesiastes 5, Dee is going to read that chapter for us. It isn't too lengthy, only 20 verses. And we will jump right in. I'm going to read from the New King James Version. Walk prudently when you go to the house of God and draw near to hear rather than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they do evil. Do not be rash with your mouth, and let not your heart utter anything hastily before God, for God is in heaven and you on earth. Therefore, let your words be few, for a dream comes through much activity, and a fool's voice is known by his many words. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed, It is better not to vow than to vow and not pay. Do not let your mouth cause your flesh to sin, nor say before the messenger of God that it was an error. Why should God be angry at your excuse and destroy the work of your hands? For in the multitude of dreams and many words there is also vanity, but fear God. If you see the oppression of the poor and the violent perversion of justice and righteousness in a province, Do not marvel at the matter, for high official watches over high official, and higher officials are over them. Moreover, the profit of the land is for all. The king himself is served from the field. He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance with increase. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. So what profit have the owners except to see them with their eyes? The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not permit him to sleep. There is a severe evil which I have seen under the sun, riches kept for their owner to his hurt. But those riches perish through misfortune. When he begets a son, there is nothing in his hand. And he came from his mother's, as he came from his mother's womb, Naked he shall return, to go as he came, and he shall take nothing from his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. And this also is a severe evil, that just exactly as he came, so shall he go. And what profit has he who has labored for the wind? All his days he also eats in darkness, and he has much sorrow and sickness and anger. Here is what I have seen. It is good and fitting for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of all his labors in which he toils under the sun all the days of his life, which God gives him, for it is his heritage. As for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth and given him power to eat of it, to receive his heritage and rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. For he will not dwell unduly on the days of his life because God keeps him busy with the joy of his heart. All right, so I kind of broke this down into sections in my own notes. I don't know if you did that. I did. So what do you have for your sections? Well, not so much sections as it is um, uh, coupled verses. Yeah. So like one and two, I instantly thought of Psalm 50. 
because God speaks to both the faithful and the wicked in that psalm. The faithful, he corrects for their offerings of burned offering of burned sacrifices, but really wants the offering of thanksgiving and to faithfully call upon him in times of trouble. But to the evil, as it, they're called, um, he corrects them for hating discipline, approving sin, allowing the mouth free reign by speaking evil, um, slandering a brother, and for the arrogance of acting like a faithful follower when it's not true. Um, James 5.12, you know, it's like, do not swear, let your yes be yes and your no, no, Um, because he talks about being rash with your mouth. And also James 1.19, to be slow to hear, slow to speak and swift to hear. Yeah. I leaned more toward lumping one all the way through seven because, I mean, it starts out, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they are doing evil. Be not rash with your mouth. Let not your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. And so I felt like that connected. At first, I didn't have one with two in my own mind. I thought it was one by itself and then two through seven. And then when I went back and looked at it, I feel like, I mean, vows are worship to God. When you look through the Old Testament, they are considered part of worship. I think there is a whole chapter in Numbers chapter 30 about how vows are to be made and carried out. And I thought about different people that have made vows, thinking about like Hannah when she made the vow to give Samuel back to the Lord, but also Jephthah's rash vow Mm -hmm. in Judges 11. And also Samson's mother, well, Samson's parents were told in Judges 13 that she would basically take the Nazarite vow. She didn't make the vow herself. She was told to take the vow for Samson who did up until a point, and then he broke that vow. Um, verses 1 through 7 are about how we approach, us, approach that worship to God. When it talks about guard your steps when you go to the house of God, what's your motive when you come to God? Because a lot of times when a vow is made, um, it's almost like a transaction, mm-hmm. like a if you, then I, or I will, so you will. As far as our Christianity goes, like there isn't a vow that we can enact with God that he hasn't already blessed us prematurely for like what like we know that we have all blessings from god james Mm 1 says that all good every good and perfect blessing comes down from the father of lights and no matter what i promise i just have a hard time saying like i'm going to make these vows to god and hope that he blesses me in turn because he's already blessed me so much. Like I already have every good and perfect blessing through Jesus. And I should be willing to do anything for God because he's already done everything good for me. And for me to come at this with a transactional mindset kind of bothers me. I don't know that I can say it's outright sin. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, I probably worded it really weird. No, it does now. But when you there is a gravity to vows. Yes. That I think we are very flippant when we make these vows. I mean... Our biggest vow to God is giving our life to him. Right. That our whole life, it, we are living sacrifices. Mm-hmm. Romans 12. But Deuteronomy 23. 21 through 23. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have Do that you have in my that? notes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm almost there. I'll read it, and then you can say whatever you're going to say about it. If you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay fulfilling it. For the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. But if you refrain from vowing, you will not be guilty of sin. You shall be careful to do what is past your lips. For you have voluntarily vowed to the Lord, your God, what you have promised with your mouth. What I was thinking was um, Matthew 5, 33, um, 33 through 37, maybe. Yeah, about oaths and stuff. Mm-hmm. Which is a vow. It's yeah, word exactly. Vow. You know, and he says, you've heard it said of those of old, you know, he's referring back to Old Testament. Don't just say you're going to do something. You've got to perform it. You've got to hold to it. Because not to do so is contrary to his will. Like, everything he says, he does. The only thing that he, he, 
reneges on is uh, punishing his people because he really doesn't want to. He wants everyone to repent, right? Like Moses, he was the intermediary. Like Moses, he was the intercessor. Jesus is our intercessor. Mm -hmm. So he he doesn't want to punish us, but there's going to come a time where he's going to fulfill his word, yeah. his his vow. I know, and so many people think and that's a scary that thing. It is. God will God always holds up his end of the bargain, but there are such things as conditional vows, you know. And so when God tells us, you know, be faithful, you will be rewarded. It's not our fault if he doesn't reward us. It's out. It's it is our fault. It's not <laughs> it's not his fault if we're not rewarded. It's our fault. Said that backwards. Um, but I do, that is such a great passage, Matthew 5. At the end, it says, let what you say simply be yes or no. Let yep. your yes be yes and your no be no. And that is a direct word from <laughs> Jesus' mouth. That's so right. you can bank on that. Another thing I thought of, too, he says, is it's better to, um, it's to draw near, near to hear rather than to give the sacrifice of fools. For they don't know they're doing evil. So obviously... There is a wrong worship. There is a sacrifice that fools make. They think they're doing right. They think yeah. they're worshiping right, but they're not. But I was thinking about Proverbs seventeen twenty eight, where he talks about it's better to listen. Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he's deemed intelligent. <laughs> oh, and right before that, Proverbs seventeen twenty seven: whoever restrains his words has knowledge. I am not a very wise person. I talk a lot. Um. Well, you know, I kept wondering, verse 3 and verse 7 made no sense to me. Like, it's like, why all of a sudden he's talking about dreams? It's like, I couldn't figure that out. And then I, I read it over and over and over. I said, there's got to be something here. Because, I mean, it's in the middle and then at the end of that. But then I read, it, it hit me when I was reading verse 6. So like, do not let your mouth cause your flesh to sin. I was like, oh, my word. My mouth gets me into trouble. When we're oh. dreaming, it's about our plans. Yeah. So mm-hmm. now I get it. So the dreams come, you know, there's a lot of words that can be said and a lot of self, self, I don't know. Focus. Yeah, there yeah. you go. Self-focus and it's like, oh, now I get it. I didn't struggle with that part of it. What was weird to me um, it's when I was looking at vows, I keep going back to the vow part, um, but it really has, like, when you look at Numbers 30, there is a whole different expectation for women than men there. Is there? Yeah. I've oh, there is. Um, which it's actually more lax, surprisingly. Yeah. We can go ahead and turn. I know I had read it before, and so when I went back and looked at it, I was like, that's right, that's right. Sometimes you're not held to your vow if you're a woman. Like if your husband hears you and opposes your vow, Forget you're it. released. However, if he hears it and lets it stand, so it's really up to your husband whether or not your vow stands at, in this section of Scripture. That's what it says. Which Well, think about that. I know. The only time we see that not happen is Hannah's vow. Hannah makes that vow on the steps, and her husband yes. isn't there, and it is upheld. But who is the church's husband? I like that. I like where you're going with this. Seriously. I mean, he has final say in different things. He does. Well, all things. He has final say in all well, things. Well, yeah, all things. Yeah, but all things. Culturally speaking, I'm not talking scripture. Like, to me, that's a flag there. Like, that's interesting. Like, I find that very interesting. But Why do you find it interesting? Just because of the way women were treated back then. And I know, we know why women are in subjection. We know why we're in submission. And I get that. It was just one of those things like, why? Like, is there, I'm, I'm wondering, like, is it because their word isn't as trustworthy? Because, I mean, we've talked about this before when we went through Mark. The witness of a woman wasn't deemed reliable. Yeah. And so in here, like, my mind connected that, like, hmm, is it her vow or is it that women are fickle? Is it some kind of negative thing? Or is this more of a great, like, I want to think it's grace space. Like, oh, you're not really in charge of your life because you're in submission to your husband, which, like you said, who are we in submission to? We're in submission to Christ. And so any vow we make needs to align with his will. 
And so I do think that is, that's how it, that's a good way to highlight it. I think Mm -hmm. the way you are, like you are in submission to your husband and any value you make should fall under his purview. Um, and you shouldn't be making vows anyway without his, <laughs> without his knowing about it. I, I don't want to say without his permission, mm-hmm. um, but any vow we make should be with consideration. I would say that goes both ways in a marriage. Personally, I know husband has the final say, but I would say a loving husband will consider his wife before he makes a vow that affects her. Again. Yep. Again. 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 Look at you. See, uh, all scripture points to Christ. It does. It does. All right, so moving on into, um, and ESV here does actually have a heading for this one, and it's the vanity of wealth and honor, which I find weird because that's not, because it just lumps the rest of the chapter into that. Yeah, that's how it is in New King James. Yeah. And so the way that I have it broken down is more verses 8 and 9 and then 10 through 17. But I think even in 10 through 17, it breaks down a little further. So verses 8 and 9... um, They are kind of, not random, just these little snippets, these ideas that do fit together broadly, but specifically, they're very separated. Mm -hmm. I think that's the only word that I can come up with. You kind of wonder what he was doing when he was writing this, or what he was thinking, or what he was looking at. Well, I mean, I think about things, and even as we're studying out these chapters, like I'll think something while I'm washing dishes, and I'll run in here real quick, I'll just write it down, and then I'll go back to my dishes. Because I'm terrified if I don't write it down. (laughs) It's not going to be there later. Um, And I will tell you, who knows what this podcast could be because I don't always. (laughs) Or who knows what it is because I didn't write it down. Yeah. Um, But I felt like they were so different from from the verses above and below. Like to me, I know it connects, but it, verses eight and nine really seemed, you know, like when you have a, like a little kid has an assignment that they bring home and it's like, which of these? It's not like the other. Mm-hmm. Verses eight and nine to me are the ones that are not like the other. They're the square when everything else is a sphere. Yeah, I agree. But I don't know. And like you said, you kind of wonder, like, why? Why is that here? And the only way that I could make it kind of connect is that last part of verse nine where it talks about a king committed to cultivated fields. Because I feel like cultivated fields are about wealth. It says not to be amazed at the matter when you notice oppression of the poor and the violation of justice. And really, in my mind, and I may have interpreted this wrong, but 8 and 9 is just talking about the king's out for gain. Like, that's what he cares about at the end of the day. And I think that's why you want to connect it down to verse um, 12. Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. They have that on their conscience. Not all rich people. No, no. I'm just saying in the instance of the person that it's discussing here, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, um, some people do that. Some people can't. Some people have a hard time sleeping knowing what they've done in order to make the money that they've made or to amass the wealth because sometimes it's not just money. It's land and other holdings and different benefits that they get from that. Um, And so in my mind, that's how I was able to connect it. But for me... You know, I like linear things, so <laughs> I felt like I was jumping all over the place to make it connect. Um, I don't know if you felt that way. Well, eight and nine are connected together, but I got where, but I got that everyone is oppressed by another. You know, there is no one that's exempt from that. You know, a child has their parents. And, not, and <laughs> when I say op- oppressed, I don't mean in a bad way. There's always someone above you. Yeah. And then ultimately, we're all under God. You're not exempt from anything. Like I said, you know, a baby has their parents. A parent has, you know, a job or, you know, your job, you have a boss. That boss has another boss. Or that one has a CEO. And they have, the CEO has the public. And, you know, it's just, it's and ongoing. All citizens everyone, and we have government. Yeah, and, and every single person is under someone. Yeah. Ultimately, we're under Christ. But we're not forced to be. Not, under Christ, not I mean, at, right. well, at, and that on sense. Judgment Day, every every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. But I mean, that's a choice we willingly submit to Him. That's why we, I think, we discussed that last season about His yoke being easy. 
Yeah, like but that this is. isn't necessarily about willingly. Right, no. no and it's even not. not willingly, we're still going to answer to God. Yeah, we you will. Know, it is not an Absolutely. oppression as far as, you know, a master, evil master to a slave. It's not that with God, but no, no, no one's exempt from that. And, but in, to me, in nine, I got the impression that the author saying this, this is good. And almost like it keep it could keep things in this check. Is game or, for a land in every way. Yeah, or he, it the good king will take care of his, those under him. The bad king won't. But yeah, to me, I got it where the author was saying that this was a good thing. All right, um, but then we flow into this section about money here. I was thinking about Matthew six nineteen through twenty four, where it talks about how you can't serve two masters. And that's where my mind immediately goes with that. I also thought of First Timothy 6.10, where Paul's saying, you know, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's that craving that you just got to have it. It's that impure motive, and it's, that's what causes us to wander from our faith. You know, it's not even that we, even, that we purposely try to make it a god. I don't think anybody ever purposely tries to make anything their God. But the uncontrollable craving for anything Mm -hmm. is is what becomes a God. I mean, Jesus warns about two masters. You can't have two masters. There's no way. One person is above another. another, You know, who's going to be your master? So here it's Hevel to me. You yeah. know, verse 10, that's Hevel. And, like, verse 11 is him saying, you can't have it all. Mm-hmm. You just can't. Verse 10 is probably, for me, one of those, like, you read through a passage and it just stands out. And that one, to me, was one of the ones that just really stood out this week. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This is also vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. Like, you can't outrun it. Like, it's the hunger just grows and grows and grows. The more you make, the more you want. And, you know, the verse 12, the sleeping of a laboring man is sleep. The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, um, whether he eats little or much. To me, it was like workers work and get what he works for. So, mm-hmm. like, you ever been to bed so full that you're just in pain? Like, you have to get up. It's just uncomfortable. You got indigestion. It's just, you know, it's just miserable. And that's, I feel, how it contrasts the two here. Oh, yeah. You know, like, the person who works and gets what he wants and he eats just enough of it, you know, what he wants, yeah. got, he's good. He sleeps fine. You know, he worked hard. He got what he, he's got food on his plate, he has to live in, whatever the case is. But then the rich man is like, oh, I got this enormous amount of food and wealth are just going to just consume yeah. it all. You know, like I said, you can't have it all. I like that. It's true, though. I mean, or, I mean, even sometimes not just because you've eaten too much, like if you eat too late, sometimes that happens. Mm-hmm. I hate that feeling. Oh. But, yeah, I see where you're going with that. I like that. And, like, 13, he talks about a severe evil that he's seen. Yeah. And he says grievous. Yeah. It, it's greed. It is. It That's is. what it is. Rich is well, kept from the owner to his hurt. I mean, it's just greedy. Heard of that um, illustration where they talk about the closed fist, Mm-mm. which a lot of times we think, which poor people can be that way too. And it's it's another principle about blessings. When you, when you are so consumed on keeping what you have, like being greedy with your blessings and like you closed your fists, no blessings can come into your hand when they're like that. Your hand, your hand should be open to blessings, but open to give them as well. Yeah. And that, you know me and my word imagery. Yeah, that's a that's a big <laughs> one for me. I thought of that with that specific verse, but I I love how it goes because to me it connects back to four, even though he's been jumping around for that next verse fourteen where it talks about those riches were lost in a bad venture, and he's a father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. So chapter four, we discussed you work and you work and you work and you have no one to share it with. And this is you work and you work and you work and you work and it's all to amass this wealth. 
and like you should be using it to bless your family and those around you and your neighbor, which Jesus says is basically everybody breathing on the planet at the moment. And when you don't and you you use it greedily because lost in a bad venture would mean you're trying to increase your wealth yet again, even though you already have a lot of wealth, you lose it and you can't bless even those you're responsible for. Yeah, so it 14 and 15 is like that grievous evil that he sees is selfishness. Mm -hmm. So there's greed, there's selfishness, which basically is the same thing to me. And the consequences Mm -hmm. of it. So 16 and 17 are about bad choices, like no prep or thought for things. And then 17 is are the consequences of that. So like 13 and 14 was about greed and selfishness and the consequences. 16 and 17 is like bad choices and of no, not prepping or thinking things through. And that is your consequence. And like 18 is the contrast. Verse 18. Mm-hmm. It's like, Enjoy what God has given you, you know, whether you're rich or poor. And it made me think of um, Galatians 3, 28 and 29, even though that it doesn't say rich or poor, but it's, you know, there's neither male nor female. There's neither Jew nor Greek, bond or free, yeah. Yeah. I mean, poor it, nor rich. Yeah, so I mean, it can go for that too. Verse 20 is the reward, not the consequences. You know, you get this reward from God. I mean, Paul was a rich young Pharisee, and um, but he counted it all as rubbish. Yeah, hevel, <laughs> hevel, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So without God, it's utterly hevel, utter rubbish, utter rubbish. Yeah. Enjoying these things isn't wrong. God, we've we've seen that before in this book. Um, but we're supposed to enjoy them at face value instead of leaning on them, letting them be our security. Um, it makes me think about what Jesus said about the man who built his barns and sat back. And he says, you the fool men. your yeah, soul is required of you. Yeah. Yep. These things will make us happy in a sense. The peace that we get that surpasses all understanding doesn't come from things. It doesn't come from other people. It comes from God. And the fulfillment that we get you know, because there is fulfillment to be had. We will see that throughout this book, but it's not in these things. And that's what he's saying. All right. Well, now that we've walked through the chapter, we've got to ask our question. Where do we see the love of Christ? I see it in verse 18. It says, here is what I have seen. It is good and fitting for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor in which he toils under the sun all the days of his life, which God gives him, for it is his heritage. Because Jesus did that. Look, I said this once before. He labored. He toiled. He he experienced it. He had fun. He, he went to weddings. And, and so I see it there in almost like, I feel like I'm saying the same thing every week, but it's like that sneak peek into Jesus's life and how we are, we can enjoy it. And, you know, we're going to get to the anchor verse, of course, but that's how we get to enjoy it. Yeah. All right. Well, I see it in something that you said <laughs> about the section on vows, um, specifically, I guess, verses four through Seven, where it talks about the vows and how Christ is our husband. We are the bride of Christ as the church. And so we have that protection that he affords. All right. Well, thank you again for joining us today. We hope that you have found this study beneficial. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to reach out to us. Of course, we have the email that we've mentioned before, and you can find that, I think, in previous show notes, maybe. Yeah, it's also on our Instagram. And you can find us on Instagram and Facebook. You can message us at either of those places. If you'd like to study, we would love to study with you or connect you with someone local to you. And we just hope that you will seek to know the love of Christ in your own life. Until next time. If you like this episode, be sure and share it with someone. In doing so, you're sharing the love of Christ.